Rochester Castle stands on the east bank of the River Medway in Rochester, Kent, southeast England. The 12th century keep or stone tower, which is the castle's most prominent feature, is one of the best preserved in England or France. Situated on the River Medway and Watling Street, Rochester served as a strategically important royal castle. During the late medieval period it helped protect England's southeast coast from invasion. The first castle at Rochester was founded in the aftermath of the Norman Conquest. It was given to Bishop Oddo, probably by his half-brother William the Conqueror. During the rebellion of 1088 over the succession to the English throne, Oddo supported Robert Curdos, the Conqueror's eldest son, against William Rufus. It was during this conflict that the castle first saw military action. The city and castle were besieged after Oddo made Rochester a headquarters for the rebellion. After the garrison capitulated, this first castle was abandoned. Between 1087 and 1089, Rufus asked Gundulf, Bishop of Rochester, to build a new stone castle at Rochester. He established the current extent of the castle. Though much altered through the centuries, some parts of Gundulf's work survive. In 1127 King Henry I granted the castle to the bishops of Canterbury in perpetuity. William de Corbeil built the massive keep that still dominates the castle today. Throughout the 12th century the castle remained in the custody of the archbishops. During the First Barons' War in King John's reign, baronial forces captured the castle from Archbishop Stephen Langton and held it against the king, who then besieged it. The Barnwell Chronicler remarked, Our age has not known a siege so hard-pressed nor so strongly resisted. After resisting for just over seven weeks, the garrison surrendered. Although the castle had been greatly damaged, with breaches in the outer walls and one corner of the keep collapsed, it was hunger that eventually forced the defender's hand. The castle did not stay under John's control for long. In 1216 it was captured by the French Prince Louis, who was the new leader of the baronial faction. John died and was succeeded by his son King Henry III in 1216. The next year, the war ended and the castle was taken under direct royal control. Rochester was besieged for the third time in 1264 during the Second Barons' War. The castle's royal constable, Roger de Laybourne, held Rochester in support of Henry III. Rebel armies led by Simon de Montfort and Gilbert de Clare entered the city and set about trying to capture the castle. Again the castle's defenders resisted, though this time with a different outcome. After a wick, the rebel armies raised the siege in the face of relief from Henry himself. Although the garrison did not surrender, the castle suffered extensive damage that was not repaired until the following century. The castle saw military action for the last time in 1381 when it was captured and ransacked during the Peasants' Revolt. As Rochester Castle fell out of use its materials were reused elsewhere and custodianship relinquished by the Crown. The castle and its grounds were open to the public in the 1870s as a park. At various points during the 19th and 20th centuries repairs were carried out. The castle is protected as a Grade I listed building and scheduled monument. Today the ruins are in the guardianship of English heritage and open to the public. Early History Castles were introduced to England by the Normans in the 11th century and their construction, in the wake of the conquest of 1066, helped the Normans secure their new territory. Rochester was an important city, built on the site of a Roman town at the junction of the River Medway and Watling Street, a Roman road. It has long been assumed that the first castle was located next to the river, just outside the southwest corner of the town walls. The conjectural site of the early castle later became known as Bowley Hill. Archaeologist Tom McNeil has suggested that these earliest castles in England may have been purely military in character, built to contain a large number of troops in hostile territory. According to the Doomsday Book of 1086, the Bishop of Rochester was given land valued at seven times four D in Aylesford, Kent. 
in compensation for land that became the site of Rochester Castle. Of the 48 castles mentioned in the survey, Rochester is the only one for which property owners were reimbursed when their land was taken to build the castle. From the 11th century the castle guard was a feudal obligation in England. This often took the form of knights garrisoning castles for their lords for a set period. There is no comprehensive list of which castles were owed service in this form, but military historian Cathcart King notes that they seem to have been predominantly high-status castles. Rochester's castle guard consisted of 60 knights' fees, marking it as a particularly important fortification. It was probably William the Conqueror who gave the city and its castle to Bishop Odo of Bayer, the king's half-brother. On William's death in September 1087 his territories were divided between his two sons. Robert, the elder, inherited the title of Duke of Normandy and William Rufus became King of England. A significant number of Norman barons objected to dividing Normandy and England, and Bishop Oddo supported Robert's claim to the English throne. Several others, including the Earls of Northumberland and Shrewsbury and the Bishop of Coutances came out in support of Robert. Oddo prepared Rochester Castle for war and it became one of the headquarters of the rebellion. Its position in Kent made it a suitable base for raids on London and its garrison could harry William's forces in the county. William set off from London and marched towards Rochester to deal with the threat. Before he arrived news reached the king that Oddo had gone to Pevensey Castle, which was under the control of Robert, Count of Mortain. William turned away from Rochester and seized Pevensey. The captured Oddo was forced to swear to hand over Rochester to William's men. The king dispatched a force with Oddo in tow to demand Rochester's surrender. Instead of yielding, the garrison Saladin captured the entire party. In response William laid siege to the city and castle. Contemporary chronicler Orderic Vitalis recorded that the siege began in May 1088. Two siege castles were built to cut off the city's supply lines and to protect the besiegers from sorties. Conditions within the city were dire. Disease was rampant, exacerbated by the heat and flies. The garrison ultimately capitulated and terms were agreed. Oddo, Eustace, Count of Boulogne, and Robert de Bellum, son of the Earl of Shrewsbury, were allowed to march away with their weapons and horses but their estates in England were confiscated. This marked the end of the castle's role in the rebellion, and the fortification was probably abandoned shortly afterwards. The siege castles were abandoned after the conclusion of the siege and have since vanished. After the abandonment of Rochester's first castle it was replaced by another on the current site, in the southwest corner of the town walls. Founded between 1087 and 1089, some parts of the castle survive although it has been much altered by use and reuse in subsequent centuries. William the Conqueror had granted Land Frank, Archbishop of Canterbury, the Manor of Haddenham in Buckinghamshire, which as of the Doomsday Survey had an annual income of £40 for the duration of his life. In turn, the Archbishop had granted the manor to Rochester's monks, so on the Conqueror's death Land Frank and Gundolf, who was appointed Bishop of Rochester in 1077, had to appeal for reconfirmation of the original grant from the new king. William Rufus demanded £100 in exchange for confirmation of the grant. The two bishops felt such a sum was beyond their means and sought a compromise. Instead it was agreed that Gundolf would build a new stone castle at Rochester. Initially the two bishops were concerned that the cost would exceed the king's original request and that they would be responsible for the castle's upkeep. However Henry, Earl of Warwick, convinced them that a castle suitable for the king could be constructed for £40 and that following its completion the castle would be handed over to someone else. The actual cost to Gundolf was £60. 
Gundolf's castle was adjacent to Rochester Cathedral. According to archaeologist Oliver Creighton, when castles were positioned close to churches or cathedrals it suggested a link between the two, and in this case both were owned by the Bishop of Rochester. Often the same craftsmen and architects would work on these closely related buildings, leading to similarities in some of their features. Along with Durham and Old Sarum, Rochester is one of the best examples of a closely linked castle and religious building. In 1127 King Henry I granted Rochester Castle to the Archbishop of Canterbury, William de Corbeil, and his successes in perpetuity. He was given permission to build a fortification or tower within the castle and keep and hold it forever. Corbeil is responsible for building the Great Tower or keep that still stands today, albeit in an altered state. The 12th century saw many castles in England rebuilt in stone, an advancement in sophistication of design and technology. Although Rochester had already been given a stone curtain wall by Bishop Gundelf, the keep dates from this period. It visually dominated the rest of the castle, towering above its outer walls, and acted as a residence containing the castle's best accommodation, a sturdy fortification. It could also serve as a stronghold in the event of military action. Such was the importance of the keep as a symbol of Rochester it was depicted on the town's seal in the 13th century. Construction progressed at a rate of about 10 feet per year. It was probably finished before Corbeil died in 1138 and definitely before 1141, when Robert, Earl of Gloucester, was imprisoned there during the anarchy of King Stephen's reign. It is likely that after the keep was built, there was no further building activity in the 12th century, although the structure was maintained. Though held by the Archbishops of Canterbury under the King, the monarch was still responsible for financially supporting the castle. Continuous records of royal expenditures known as pipe rolls began in the reign of Henry II, and included in the rolls are details of expenditure on Rochester Castle's upkeep. During the 12th century, these were generally small figures, but in 1172 to 1173 more than £100 was spent on the castle, coinciding with the rebellion of Henry II's sons. Following the fall of Normandy in 1204 to the French forces of King Philip II, King John increased his expenditure on the castles in southeast England in preparation for a possible invasion. Amongst these was Rochester and in 1206 John spent £115 on the castle's ditches, keep, and other structures. Under England's Angevin kings royal castles in southeast England were invested in to protect the country from invasion. Rochester was one of the most important. King John Custody of Rochester Castle remained with the Archbishops of Canterbury until the end of the 12th century. Despite ascending to the throne in 1199, King John did not confirm Hubert Walter as the castle's custodian until July 1202. John may have wished to regain direct control of what was an important castle. The crisis of John's rule began in 1212 with the discovery of a plot to overthrow him. Defeat at the Battle of Bouvines in July 1214 marked the end of John's ambitions to retake Normandy and exacerbated the situation in England. He returned to England in October and a few months later barons in the north of England were actively challenging his rule. A group of barons renounced their feudal ties to John in May 1215, and they captured London, Lincoln, and Exeter. John persuaded Stephen Langton, the new Archbishop of Canterbury, to cede control of Rochester Castle to a royal constable, Reginald de Cornhill. Under the terms of the agreement, the castle was to revert to the control of the Archbishop at Easter 1215. This period was later extended to Easter 1216. Letters patent dated 25 May 1215 requested that other royal constables would take over from Cornhill.
the castle would still be returned to the archbishop when the agreement expired or if peace was restored to the kingdom before Easter 1216. In the meantime, control reverted to Langton whom John had asked to hold the castle in such a way that by it no ill or harm shall come to us or our kingdom. John met the rebel barons at Runnymede, and on 19 June 1215 they renewed their vows of fealty. A peace treaty, which later became known as Magna Carta, was sealed. Shortly after the treaty the agreement between John and Langton to appoint a royal constable in charge of Rochester Castle was dissolved, returning control to the Archbishop. The peace did not last and the First Baron's War broke out. A group of rebels headed to Rochester to hold the city against John. The events surrounding the rebels' takeover of the castle are unclear, but contemporary chronicler Ralph of Coggeshall recorded that the king demanded Langton hand over the castle to royal control and the archbishop refused. Although Langton held out against the king's demands, the rebels feared he would eventually cave to pressure from the king and seized control of Rochester Castle for themselves. According to Ralph of Coggeshall, this was done with the consent of the castle's constable, Reginald de Cornhill, who seems to have switched allegiance from the king to the archbishop after John appointed him as royal constable of the castle. Langton left the country that same month, leaving the castle in the hands of the king's enemies. In a letter that year to Justichar Hubert de Burg, John expressed his anger towards Langton, calling him the notorious traitor to us since he did not render our castle of Rochester to us in our so great need. After this point, Rochester Castle was no longer considered to be in the perpetual custody of the Archbishops of Canterbury. At the time, John was in southeast England recruiting mercenaries in preparation for his war with the barons. Rochester blocked the direct route to London, which was also held by the rebels. According to Roger of Wendover, the rebels at Rochester were led by William Dorbini, Lord of Beaver. Estimates of the size of Rochester's garrison vary, with the chronicler's figures ranging from 95 to 140 knights, supported by crossbowmen, sergeants, and others. Hearing the news that the city was in enemy hands, John immediately rode to Rochester and arrived on 13 October. Royal forces had arrived ahead of John and entered the city on the 11th of October, taking it by surprise and laying siege to the castle. Rochester Bridge was pulled down to prevent the arrival of a relief force from London. The siege that followed was the largest in England up to that point and would take nearly two months. Bowley Hill to the south of the castle may have been used as John's headquarters during the siege. According to the Barnwell Chronicler, five siege engines hurled a barrage of stones at the castle's wall day and night. These were supported by missiles from smaller bows and crossbows. Though the Barnwell Chronicler claimed they smashed a hole in the castle's outer walls, Roger of Wendover asserted they were ineffective and that John turned to other methods to breach the defences. A letter dated 14 October indicates John was preparing to undermine the castle's walls. He rode to Canterbury, asking for the production, by day and night of as many picks as you are able, and that they be sent to Rochester. On 26 October a relief force of 700 horse was sent from London. They turned back before arriving, perhaps because they heard the king was advancing to meet them. When the castle's outer walls were eventually breached, the defenders retreated to the relative safety of the keep. It too withstood the efforts of the siege engines, and once again John turned to mining to bring down the walls. The mine was dug beneath the southeast corner of the keep. A letter sent from Rochester on 25 November offers insight into the methods of medieval siegecraft. John ordered Hugh de Burg to send to us with all speed by day and night forty of the fattest pigs of the sort least good for eating to bring fire. Beneath the tower, the wooden props supporting the tunnel dug beneath the keep were set alight to collapse the mine, bringing down one corner of the keep. 
Still the garrison held out and sought safety behind the stone partition or cross wall in the keep, abandoning half the building. The Barnwell Chronicler remarked that, for such was the structure of the stronghold that a very strong wall separated the half that had fallen from the other. Conditions within the keep worsened by the day and the garrison were reduced to eating horse flesh. In an attempt to reduce the demand on limited provisions, some members were sent out of the keep, beginning with those least capable of fighting. Some sources record that they had their hands and feet amputated by the besiegers. On 30 November the garrison eventually surrendered and were taken captive. Initially John wanted to execute them all as was the custom of the time when a garrison had forced a long and bloody conflict. Savaric de Morleans, one of John's captains, persuaded the king otherwise, concerned that similar treatment would be shown to royal garrisons by the rebels. Only one person was executed, a crossbowman who had previously been in the service of the king since childhood was hanged. Many of the rebels were imprisoned, sent to royal castles such as Corfe for safekeeping. Of the siege the Barnwell Chronicler wrote, Our age has not known a siege so hard-pressed nor so strongly resisted. Afterwards few cared to put their trust in castles. Prince Louis of France, son of Philip II, was invited by the barons to become the new leader of the rebellion and become king in the event of their victory. In 1216 he arrived in England and captured Rochester Castle. It is not known how, however, as no documentary evidence recording the event survives.